Hi, welcome to the Awkward Angler Podcast, an authentic series talking about fishing, social justice, and storytelling with folks within the outdoor industry. I'm your host, Erica Nelson. My pronouns are she and her. I'm a self-taught angler that is passionate about sharing my learning journey. I am also a Brown Folks Fishing Ambassador, an organizational leadership developer with incredible amounts of optimism. Understanding that we all have something to learn from each other, this podcast is for the aspiring, the beginner, the mediocre, and the expert angler willing to learn new skills and how to be a better ally. Working through hard conversations can definitely get a little awkward. We fumble through them and worry about getting it right. It's time to step out of your comfort zone and start getting awkward. This show is for mature audiences. Be sure to follow for updates on awkwardangler.com and on Instagram at awkwardangler. On today's episode, I had the pleasure of speaking and laughing a lot with Anna Lay, and we get to hear about her career as a fish biologist. I realize I risk sounding like a fool sometimes. However, I didn't learn how to fish till I was 31, and my outdoor adventures didn't begin till my mid-20s. So to me, all fish look the same, and the conservation industry gets a little confusing on so many levels. But this episode speaks to hatcheries and fisheries. While there's something for everyone to learn on this episode, my target is for beginners to let them know it's okay not to know everything about fish. I encourage you to keep up at it, and over time, you'll start to understand the different types of fish. We'll discuss the fish spawn cycle and dating. Be sure to take the poll on this episode's Instagram. We also dive into the beauty of transgendered fish and people. Please note, I'm not perfect, neither is Anna, and we still make mistakes. I'm always learning and even find myself fumbling through terms, working in social justice. It's work that's ever evolving. My goal for this podcast is for people to understand that social justice conversations can sometimes get awkward, but we work through them. Avoiding them is not the answer nor the work. So reach for your uncomfort zone and join us. Hey everyone, I'm Anna. I currently work for Colorado Parks and Wildlife as a seasonal biologist. Uh, My background is in fisheries and wildlife sciences. And I met Erica a couple weeks back out in Crested Bee. We actually got to do some fishing together. And um, yeah, here today to kind of talk with Erica about some fish stuff. So I'm super excited. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks so much. So about fish stuff, I have had a really, really hard time figuring out different types of fish species. Mm -hmm. The only fish I could finally identify was a cutthroat Mm -hmm. because it had like the distinct mark. But that took me for a long time to like figure out, is this a brown trout or is this a rainbow? And then now I found out there's like all kinds of different cutthroat trout. Mm And in my research, I've been trying to like figure out like their behavior, you know, how do they spawn and, you know, Mm -hmm. just different, how do you tell the difference? And then anything that comes up is just like Latin language, you know, and it's really dry and it's really boring. Yes. (laughs) So (laughs) anyway, um, so I'm kind of hoping to talk about that and then Mm -hmm. um, eventually get into some questions that some folks had on Instagram. And then also just talking about just other inclusion stuff when it comes to fish and people. So we'll see what happens and what comes up. (laughs) So I'm so curious um, to start off with what is your, what's your job? Like, what do you actually do? What's a fish (laughs) biologist do? (laughs) So right now, because I'm a seasonal, my job changes often and I move around quite often. So every few months I'll bounce around from different cities to different towns to even different states. So overall, a fish biologist does everything regarding research, education, outreach, and then the management side to things. So when you are an angler going out to fish, there is researchers and scientists behind the fish that you're catching. So whether or not it's um, being mindful of how many fish are within that one stream or watershed districts. And so they're doing research on seeing like the population is sustainable um, and then putting also putting management out to tell people how much they can or can't fish and doing some research to ensure that everything is going accordingly to plan. So more conservation efforts. And so yeah, so right now my job consists of all of those things, but everyone has different tasks and duties depending on the projects and the species and focus. What were you doing in Colorado? So in Colorado, over in the summertime, I was traveling throughout the state kind of measuring some stream habitats, so ensuring 
or a kind of measuring how much water are in the streams and how each channel and stream are kind of structured and that kind of helps make policies regarding like water rights and ensuring that there's water inside of that stream for fish populations and for the forest and for like the healthiness of the ecosystem. And then for example, last fall, I was in Oregon um, collecting Chinook, carcass car uh, Chinook salmon carcasses during their spawning season. So it changes throughout the years and the projects in each job. Whoa, that's awesome. <laughs> Have you had like one particular project that was just like terrible? Um, I, oh, they're gonna hate me for saying this, but last summer I was on a project where I was doing the same thing of like stream habitat surveys, but it was in Southern Oregon. And at almost every single day, it was over 100 degree weather and like knee deep and poison oak. <laughs> and all of the streams were super dry and we had to hike down cliffs. And then there was one day where I got attacked by hornets and had to go to um, urgent care and get a shot in my butt. So that was like my least favorite memory <laughs> of a job. But it was right after college. So I was like, I'll take whatever I can get at this point. <laughs> like what's the favorite project you've worked on? Um, the Colorado Parks and Wildlife job right now is super fun and my favorite maybe like all time when I'm older and kind of telling like back in my day stories it would have to be the shouldn't have carcass story <laughs> just because I learned how to row and got to raft every day and just like <laughs> sling dead fish over my shoulder so that yeah. was aw super awesome. I had the like best Michelle Obama arms last season. <laughs> it was they were like toned and defined and I was walking around like in 30 degree weather with a tank top because I was just wanting to show it off. <laughs> Michelle Obama. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. I know that I've asked you this question. I live near the Roaring Judy Hatchery. Mm -hmm. So do you work for hatcheries? Like, would you have connection to hatcheries? Like, what's what, what, what do hatcheries even do? <laughs> so the difference between a fisheries and a hatchery is that fisheries has more of a research and management component to it. And so when you're looking at licenses and regulations, those are the people behind making those calls and kind of understanding how many fish a person can catch before you decimate an entire population within a one, like one stream. Mm -hmm. um, hatcheries are more of like the production side to it. And so if you are looking at a stream, there are numbers behind all of those. Um, so Colorado, the state of Colorado stocks about over 90 million fish, I believe. Wow. Yeah. Um, so each hatchery is dependent on each location. So the one next to you would most likely stock like the Gunnison River and the Taylor River. Mm -hmm. um, and those folks are the ones kind of breeding the fish and taking the eggs and the milts from the males and females and kind of putting a bunch of baby fish out in the, the river so people can catch and eat mm -hmm. and, and kind of stock the rivers. Yeah, so the agencies do have ties to hatcheries. So they are one in the same, but there are two different backgrounds for hatcheries and fishery stuff. Mm. So I've always been curious on like, how do fish spawn? Like one, like how does, how do they do that in the hatchery, but also how do they happen in real life? <laughs> yeah, let's, let's start with the real life because it is one of my favorite stories to tell. Oh. Um, so Colorado is a little bit different because it is a landlocked state and there are no natural waterways going out into the ocean. Um, so what I mean about natural waterways is that usually in a river or stream in the mountain area would be like 100 miles away from the ocean, but the fish can still get out to it no mm. matter what. So those waters would be flowing out into the river. Um, Colorado is more of landlocked, whereas there are it's kind of impossible for fish from the ocean to get back up into Colorado mountains mm -hmm. and then fish don't even come out either. So therefore that's why it's a lot of stocked fish inside of the rivers there. Um, so when I was working in Oregon, a lot of these fish are called anadromous, um, meaning that they start off in the freshwater ecosystem. So like rivers and lakes, and then once they get to a certain age, they migrate out into the ocean and it's been about, two to five years depending on the species just feeding and getting super fat and that's like one of those prize fish that you see on instagram and then after they're ready to have um sex their hormones just kind of jump up and they're just like super horny teenagers and they spend about a couple of <laughs> weeks migrating back upstream and so this entire migration can take up to 200 miles at least but the entire process they are starving themselves because they're saving all the energy to go have sex pretty much and 
they're not eating anything. So during spawning season, a lot of fishermen are going to think like, oh, fish are coming back, therefore I should go catch them. But mm -hmm. oftentimes, once you cast a fly out, even if it's in front of their face, they will not eat because they're like, I have a goal and that goal is to have sex and then die. And throughout this entire process, this 200 mile, they're facing dams and waterfalls and climate change and bears and also humans and um, anything that's going against them. And so their chances of survival are super low throughout this entire process of going from a river to migrating out to the ocean and then from the ocean migrating up into the mountains. And salmon are really awesome in the fact that they have like internal compasses in their heads and then they can also smell. And so their internal compass allows them to go back to the exact location that they were born and then they can actually smell like chemicals around that natural habitat that they were born in and to go to the exact place that they're there. And mm -hmm. so once they come back, it's like male on male where they're battling to, to get the female and the females are there digging out their nests. And it's pretty cool because the females will use their tail to pick up these giant rocks and push them aside. And these mm -hmm. rocks can be about a softball size. Wow. And they're digging it and these males will come and whoever wins would have, would, would be able to fertilize the eggs with the female. Mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately, like humans, the salmon also have like little cheaters and they are called like jack salmons or sneaker males. Mm -hmm. And so these males are a lot smaller and they only are out in the ocean for about a year until they come back. So they're a lot smaller compared to the giant males, which are about three feet long. And these sneaker males won't have to battle the giant males. They'll kind of hang out and then cheat their way into having sex with these females. <laughs> and so Ooh. they'll just like sneak right into the nest, kind of really so scandalous. Awkward. I know. It's like okay. a cheating way of going about it, but it still works in a way, which yeah. makes me so mad. Um, <laughs> but these sneaker males will just like sneak right into it as like the males are off in the distance battling out with one another. And these sneaker males would just like go right into the nest, release all the sperm that they have, and then just go away. And so you think about these like big, beautiful males kind of working their asses off and mm -hmm. trying to get like the biggest female salmon that they, they can to pass on their genes. And then these smaller male salmon who didn't have to do as much work are just getting away with it. And so that's, that's like the salmon life cycle. And after this goes about for a couple of weeks, um, depending on the season and just depending on the species, they'll ultimately die and then bring all of that back into the rivers and the forests. Mm. Okay, <laughs> so like I'm missing a key detail here. Like, how do fish have sex? Like, if that's like their goal. <laughs> Like, like you gave me a really beautiful, like, overview, but I'm like, wait, 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 is there, like, penetration involved? Like, how, like... So not all fish penetrate. Okay. <laughs> but there are some that do, right? There are some that do, oh, but okay. for the salmon, the salmon will just, um, the, the females will just release their eggs, and then the males will just release their sperm, and then the water will just kind of mix and mingle okay. and whatever fertilizes fertilizes and gets lucky mm -hmm. and so that's the case with salmon but a fish like it's something called a ratfish and it's related to a shark it's in the ocean mm -hmm. their penises are on their heads huh. <laughs> so maybe you can look that up later they're called ratfish and they're super cute they're chimeras <laughs> um but their cloacas are on their head and so it's not very obvious it's not like a thing just wobbling around it's just a little tiny piece on the top of their head and that's like their their gonads or their sexual organs so where where do they put that so I am not entirely sure how it works I don't okay. know if it's like head on head action or okay. like a head on behind action yeah. I think that's the case of um, a male ratfish having the cloaca attaching to a female Got and it. it's it's almost like like <laughs> uh, sometimes fish will like kind of wrap each other around like a betta fish. If you have two betta fish in a tank, yeah. they'll kind of just wrap around, and their um, sexual organs will just connect somehow, like the movie Avatar. You know how they just have okay. like, <laughs> which is Pocahontas, by the way. Anyway. Oh. Avatar, the whole theme. Anyway, so just my. I didn't side know note. that. It, right. It's like. <laughs> Anyway. Wow. 
we're learning a lot today. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess back to the hatcheries part of how uh, the salmon reproduce and have Ooh. sex. Um, pretty much I was in that process. They take the female once it returns into the hatchery. So that whole like migrating out, migrating back in happens in a hatchery setting, but sometimes they'll just have the male and the female mm -hmm. in two separate cages. And so they would most likely whack the female on the head and then pushes her stomach out to get all of the eggs and then also take the male and take the sperm, which is called milt. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's a couple male to per female to have it like diverse in genetics. And then you mix it up in a little tank hmm. and wait. So it's not as grand and beautiful, but it's like the more scientific technological side to yeah. producing fish. Yeah. Well, I'm in, I'm like intrigued. And I think there was, I'm going to jump down to one of the questions from yeah. Instagram. Somebody had asked, ask about Jack's and sneaker males, some fun parallels to human society, LOL. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so back to those sneaker males. That's what I was saying, how like the sneaker males are almost like the human society part of it. Like some people work a lot harder to woo their, their mates and their partners, whereas other people just get away with cheating and not working as hard. And those are the people that are like, oh, like I should have known better, you know, like I didn't see it coming. <laughs> Okay. And oftentimes when I tell kids, I'm like, you want to be the giant males and the females that work their hardest to get their partners and not cheat your way through life like the sneaker males or the dogs. <laughs> I mean, I'm kind of thinking like smarter, not harder though. I know. That's why. And then that's what they hit me back with. I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it is smarter and they work. It works the same way in their favor, but... <laughs> <laughs> so be it <laughs> yeah so let's talk about like I, I I'm still having a hard I think I just figured out how to tail uh the difference between a male fish and a female fish but yeah can you walk me through like how to tell the differences and like because I'm I normally fish like um well my first this is my first season catching kokanee so that was <gasps> exciting congrats thank you and um where I fish is mostly brown trout rainbow mm -hmm. trout and cutthroat so um yeah so feel free to share on those or any other type of fish on the differences okay uh well yeah kokanee are super awesome they are landlocked coho for those of people who don't know um they are just coho salmon that don't migrate out and they're just stuck in one place. Mm -hmm. um, so the differences between a male and a female, it's really hard to tell unless you cut open the fish and you look at their sexual organ organs. Mm -hmm. And so with the male, you'll see like, not the males, you'll see testes and the females, you'll see either eggs or ovaries. And so that's how you can probably tell. But during like spawning season, especially like kokanee, for example, you can kind of tell depending on like the colors they are, the size that they have and then um, specific identifying characteristics such as like a super humped back. I don't know like some of the photos that I saw you catch some of your companies you had like a very defined hump and so yeah. that is usually like a, a sexy characteristics that kind of woo the females into them and then what's called a kipe and that's like that very prominent hooked nose mm. and only usually only males would have those and that's kind of like a uh, another part of a body that allows the males to kind of hook on hook onto the female a little bit more of that like really defined prominent hooked nose and that's like a male characteristics and then females if you think about it their body will be more um up for holding a bunch of eggs and so they'll have like longer snake like bodies and so if you ever go catch steelhead you can probably tell about their long silvery bodies that are a lot longer mm -hmm. and you can probably tell that's a female whereas a male would have like bulkier kind of more prominent identifying characteristics hmm. and so pretty much just depends on the species but for the most part it's kind of hard unless it's spawning season and you kind of have those more defined characteristics come in mm. I, I always hear a lot of people referring to fish as he <laughs> like get him there he goes you know have you noticed that <laughs> I have noticed that and it makes you so angry because it's like the female are just as important and it's like how are you just gonna call every fish he yeah 
oh my god it's just like reinforcing the patriarchy and how much yeah. we give like men so much credit yeah <laughs> over like everything of like females are powerful and strong too we can put up a fight mm-hmm. like <laughs> and it's also like anthropomorphizing animals where it's like you see a cute bunny you automatically call it a she you know like look at that yeah. cute bunny she's doing so well and it's like all of the cute animals are like she's and then all of the male masculine animals are he's and so Ugh kind of having that like gender roles for animals whereas yeah. that's not the case <laughs> I know drives me nuts so I, I, I actually I think most of the people I fish with have not like they stop themselves <laughs> yeah <laughs> like for it like get it or them yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> pronouns are interesting because it's like you know I think about people that are trans there's so many different types of gender identities and but people are so quick to correct people about their dogs like, yes <laughs> or their babies yeah. like, when all babies really look like, the same when they're just like born and it's like oh look at she and they're like it's actually a he and they get so defensive over it <laughs> right yeah. the reason like that I was inspired to reach out to you and yeah you know, invite you here to have this <laughs> awkward conversation <laughs> Is because I I like to kind of look up random hashtags. Like for me, me diversifying my own social media is me mm-hmm. researching things that I would never think to research. And so yeah. or like, you know, how can I get connected to other? I found like really great people just by um, searching random hashtags. <laughs> but yeah. I was researching um, like, hey, is there any trans uh anglers out there so i was researching like trans fish trans anglers you know of like how can i get connected and, and just support and follow and then i found that that there was a fish that's transgendered so that like blew my mind that like this happens do you what do you know about that <laughs> it's awesome because it's it's almost super beautiful to, to see that it happens in nature and that's a natural thing, you yeah. know? Mm-hmm. And we think it's like the coolest thing and we're learning more about it and learning more about the transgender community and t- transgender individuals and how to, you know, learn more about um, that community and kind of like respect yeah. pretty much and appreciate. And so looking at transgender fish or like hermaphrodism, mm-hmm. I found out that there's a bunch of species that partake in both a female and a male like organ and that's just part of their natural sexual life and um, some of the fish that people are probably familiar and probably you're familiar is that if you watch Finding Nemo, Mm -hmm. Marlin, um, the the clownfish, the one that are in the sea and enemies and stuff, those are actually hermaphrodites and they can actually change between male and female. And a lot of people don't know that and other fish such as like a parrotfish and a ras, and these are mostly fish on their are in the ocean and not freshwater fish. Mm -hmm. Um, But there are about like 13 species of fish that do this and some fish can go from male to female and other fish go from female to male or some fish can actually go back and forth between the two genders. Um, And it's kind of depending on their social structures is what I found out about learning more about them after you reached out to me and I was like, I kind of don't know much about them, but it's super interesting because it's almost like a social hierarchy that's lacking within their their community or their um, partnership with each other. And I found out that a lot of fish who that do that don't really school together. So in the ocean, you'll find like a lot of anchovies or a lot of tunas and they're in giant groups with each other. Um, so clownfish or pearfish are oftentimes like dispersed within the ocean or the coral reefs. And they're kind of just like isolated from each other. Mm-hmm. And so I found that like they, with those individual species, they are more prone to having both a female and a male organ or sexual organs because they are able to go back and forth depending on what the needs is within that community. And yeah, which is pretty cool because it's depending on the the social structure, there's lack of male to female ratio. Some of the fish would um, go more to the male side, if there's lack of female to male ratio, it'll be back and forth and kind of have that balance with one another. Whoa. Yes. And then I found that some fish can actually reproduce on its own. So, so there's this one fish, um, mangrove killifish that are hermaphrodites, but they can change to a female, lay the eggs and then change to a male. And then 
fertilize those eggs. And so they're pretty much self-reproducing on their own. And I was like, that is the most amazing thing. And if I can do that, I would totally do. <laughs> oh yeah. I did not know that. That's mind blowing. And that it's like part of the society or the structure of the community. That is amazing. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was the coolest part of like, it's the social structure and it's kind of like a natural process and, yeah. and it's just super beautiful to kind of recognize that. Wow. Most indigenous tribes have anywhere from three to five different genders in their mm -hmm. community. And so in the Navajo community, we, we recognize five, you know, which is male, female, um, male trans and trans mm -hmm. woman. And so, and then there's also um, two spirit as well. Mm -hmm. And so the two spirit and trans folks are typically held in higher regard um, just because they can see different worlds. They have a different perspective. Um, they're often shamans or medicine people, um, you know, and that was kind of stripped away from, you know, assimilation and, and colonization, but it definitely fit the needs of the community. That's kind of like yeah. the, the compare, you know, the similarity that I'm seeing in the, that culture versus, you know, native indigenous cultures as well. And, you know, recognizing that fluidity is beautiful, you mm -hmm. know, and that's something that's like beyond the binary. Um, regards to that, I do have a question because yeah. I learned about two spirits back when I was in undergrad and learning about like gender and just different um, genders within different cultures. So like the two spirits is what I'm kind of familiar with. But yeah. now since that's more of a learning opportunity to a lot of folks, um, what are your thoughts on people using two spirits that are not indigenous? So that is uh, highly offensive, mm -hmm. and I, 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 I will say that, that nobody can be two-spirit that is not indigenous. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I would say that's a form of cultural appropriation. <laughs> How, like if I were to be an ally, like if I'm an ally and I hear someone using those terminologies and they're not indigenous, like how... How can I kind of open that conversation up, even though I'm not trans or even though I'm not within that community? Like, how can I step mm -hmm. up and say like, hey, that's yeah. culturally inappropriate? Yeah, I mean, just that. There is some recognition that's lacking, which is a lot of indigenous cultures were killed, you know, and for so many years, were unable to be themselves, to self-identify mm -hmm. as, you know, gay or trans or two-spirit, you know, and that to me is, is pretty messed up when, you know, people can just take from these cultures that have mm -hmm. gone through so much trauma to take that away from them. So, mm -hmm. um, that to me is super aggravating. Um, but I guess just kind of, I have some resources that I can post and send to you as well, which is just understanding like the historical practices were once illegal. And now that it is kind of, we're trying to recognize and, and get back into our, our own culture, you mm -hmm. know, that that's a process and that's highly offensive when someone can come in and just take and, and benefit off of that. And, yeah. And so just kind of, I kind of like to lead with questions um, when I approach somebody of, you know, tell me why, you know, you think that, like, why do you identify as such? And of course, that's also some sensitivity because that's asking a lot from somebody that mm -hmm. might truly, really hold on to that identity. Um, but asking, you know, and, and sharing information of, you know, that's, you know, a form of cultural appropriation, um, you know, that was stripped away from Indigenous people for so long, you know, what gives you the right to claim this? And I mm -hmm. think leading with curiosity is really helpful instead of coming in with blaming people and like telling them they're wrong. <laughs> Um, hopefully, I mean, that there, it just depends on the situation also as well, right? Like people yeah. see things differently and, you know, and, and feel free to share like any, any other resources that I also can share with you, but, mm -hmm. um, that's just kind of my quick spiel there. <laughs> no, and I really appreciate it. And I love how you offered resources and that's going to be super helpful because like me, I'm always learning mm -hmm. and no matter how much I think I know I there's so much I don't know and just yeah. like being open to getting feedback from other folks to correct me as well yeah no exactly I'm the same way I'm constantly learning not only about fish but also like um yeah just culture mm -hmm. and you know racial justice as well <laughs> so just a couple other things um that I I found interesting about two-spirit as well which is mm -hmm. um 
each indigenous tribe has their own definition of what it means to them. And so you can ask like two different tribes of two spirit and we'll probably, and you'll probably have two different answers. So it is very individualistic, not only to the person, but also the tribe itself. Okay. So that in itself is a little, it is really hard for folks, um, especially used to binary labels to comprehend Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, because it's just this unknown, you know, we're either male or we're female, which interestingly enough, there's actually an intersex population as well. So that is um, a a baby that's born with Mm -hmm. both female and male um, uh, body parts. So like sexual organs. And so, um, and there's really no clear identity when they're born. So Mm -hmm. typically parents or doctors will just label one or the other. Okay. (laughs) And intersex people are actually as common as redheads. So that's about 1% Mm -hmm. of the population that people are born intersex. And so, you know, I I would always advise like the the best thing you can do is ask someone their pronouns, you know, Mm -hmm. and there's so many different ways to identify as well. Um, Also another thing about two-spirit it is, um, it's also not interchangeable with being gay or lesbian. Okay. And so I noticed that it is added to like the LGBTQ acronym, but it's also not part. You can be two-spirit and gay, but it's not interchangeable. Got it. So I think that's also a misrepresentation going back to your question about your friend. You know, they might might likely have a misconception about it mm-hmm. where it is part of this um, LGBTQ world, but it's actually not, and it's separate, and only Native Americans, um, Indigenous folks can identify as two-spirit. So that's kind of like the overall (laughs) respect. (laughs) Yeah, no, Um, thank you for clearing that up, because I feel like, you know, like what you talked about of like everything being stolen from a lot of communities and bringing it back up, and now all of a sudden everything's a trendy term or a trendy name for it, and yeah. People are just taking it left and right. And it's like, how do you respect both communities without kind of culturally appropriating of one of them? Yeah, exactly. Some of the terms that I've noticed you using as well when talking about fish was like hermaphrodite, which I find fascinating. And I, I, I'm, I'm not a fish biologist, so that's probably the appropriate term to use. Mm-hmm. But just kind of some information about terms that are outdated or inaccurate yeah. um, or offensive. So some of them are gender identity disorder. So that was like an outdated term. There's also Mm -hmm. the term um, hermaphrodite. So the appropriate term there would be intersex. There's also (laughs) pre-op, post-op type of sex change operation, Mm -hmm. female tranny, um, transsexual. So new terms, which is either trans men, trans woman, um, intersex, gender queer, gender non-binary, gender non-conforming. There's so many. <laughs> yes. And just going back into that, I love how you pointed it out. It is like a scientific term, but then also science predominantly are white male dominant. And so I'm pretty sure that they are the ones dictating those terminology that had to stick with it. And if it was me, I'd be like, we're changing it as terminology is changing it. Because as I was saying it, I was like, oh, I this is so, so cringy, but <laughs> every single like research article would be like hermaphrodites or, you know, like yeah. other um, different terms for it, but it's just mostly be like hermaphrodites. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure back in the day, someone out there, you know, kind of determine what that fish was called. Totally. No, that's a really good observation. <laughs> There's so much work to do. There's so much to do. <laughs> Oh, anyway. Okay. So I have another question from a follower. Um, and, oh, oh, sorry. I should have actually started with this because now I'm going back to what we were talking about before as <laughs> what was your path to becoming a fish biologist? Like what was that? Oh, like for you? Um, super complicated. <laughs> so I graduated from Oregon State University with a fisheries and wildlife science degree. Um, bachelor's, so only undergrad, not sure if I want to go back to grad school at all, but that was the path um, originally from Southern California, but I started off as a marine biologist, and then after 2016, during that election, um, I kind of thought that I was going to be screwed with my career choice, and so I was like, everyone loves hunting and fishing, so I kind of made that switch and spent hours 
uh, volunteering, doing free unpaid labor for three years. Um, some, some of it consisted of going out to sea, puking my brains out. Other stuff consisted of like playing with fish guts or like picking out bugs in a lab underneath a microscope for 40 hours a week, all of it like unpaid. Um, and then like, I like what you mentioned before of like looking at a cutthroat fish or a rainbow trout and not being able to tell the difference. And so believe it or not, it took me almost like 40 hours a week or so taking this one class on fish identification wow. and learning Latin terminology. So I have like over 500 Latin terminology for 500 different fish memorized and like who's related to who and their like evolutionary traits and remember getting to that salmon and trout part and just sitting in a lab just smelling the alcohol that it was preserved in all these fish are dead and just looking at them I'm like I can't tell the difference at all like everything looks the same um <laughs> and then fast forward I became a fish biologist through a lot of internships working with state agencies and nonprofits, and also have an environmental education background so kind of meshing those two together to work with the public and kids and doing research on the side. So that's how I became a fish biologist. Whoa. Wow. <laughs> and I guess like I'm not home in, in Denver right now, but like I have a bunch of these fish books. And so the diversity of fishes. Nice. Yeah. So then in huge here, you'll, you'll learn about fish biology, like how they breathe and eat. Oh my God. Swim. That font is so small too. It's so small. And then yeah, just an entire course dedicated to like the evolutionary traits of fish and who's connected to who and then how they breathe and how they swim and their body shapes and also just like their anatomy. So think about like a doctor, but just for fish. And, yeah. and when people are like their fish, their classes dedicated for fish, it's like, yes, like you have to learn about the differences. And pe although people are like, oh, all fish looks the same, it's, mm -hmm. it's not usually the case. <laughs> That's pr it's literally the first two years of my fishing mm -hmm. was they all look the same. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can, now I know the difference of a brown trout and a rainbow, but that's about it. <laughs> and a kind of cocoa, uh, coho. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what are some easy ways that people can identify a brown trout, for example? Sometimes they, like, I feel like they kind of have, like, that rainbow stripe as well with the rainbow trout. So, like, what's mm -hmm. your big takeaway or like giveaway so those brown trouts have that very prominent those prominent dots to them or those spots throughout their body mm -hmm. um so unlike rainbow and cutthroat trout brown trout will have like a darker spot in the middle and then a light ring about it or a, a light ring around it so like a little halo and a dark middle mm -hmm. and that's throughout the entire brown trout but then you can also get into like science of it of like looking how big the eye is compared to the mouth or how big the mouth extends past the eye and then looking at the tail size and looking at what we call like par marks and um, counting the fin rays. And so that's what the research side is to it. But if I were to teach like a fish identification class, it'd be as simple as like look for those spots and recognize that white halo around the black spots and that's how you can probably tell it's a brown trout and also um kind of doing de deeper research in the area that you're living in and seeing like oh yeah there's brown trout in this river so I'm either seeing a rainbow or a brown trout today mm -hmm. cool so you give fish lessons yes <laughs> <laughs> tell me about that what does that look like who, um, <laughs> who do you teach to Besides so me. I so I teach to a lot of kids right now, um, primarily like K through 12 students. I teach them a lot about like the salmon biology side of it and then also like identification and what they eat and their life cycle. But also to anyone who reaches out and has any questions on like, what is this fish? Or like, what do they eat? I always love answering questions and just yeah. helping people out without all that scientific jargon. That So if you can figure out what fish eat, you must be really good at fly fishing. No. No. <laughs> no. So <laughs> fish doctor isn't roping. <laughs> I know. So <laughs> um that's a funny story. And I was actually telling uh my friend about it when I went car fishing the other day and I was like, Yeah, so Erica and I like she gave me so much crap and sh all she told me was to go find fish and I found a pool of fish. And remember those like 
five brown trout that we saw it was so wet and it was super clear water mm-hmm. and we were just sitting there and I was like I have no shot of Cassie and I was using a Tinkara which was pretty much a stick in a in a and like a leader a at that point yeah it was a little cat toy of just like woo and I was like Erica come over here and you just sat there for about an hour just casting into the pond right in front of the, the <laughs> mouth of the fish and I was like I found you the fish <laughs> and you couldn't catch them <laughs> so <laughs> So no, I I can find the fish for you and I can tell you what they're eating, but I am trying to build up my skills to become a better fly angler. (laughs) I thought you had like all the secrets and all the... Oh my gosh, no. (laughs) You have this down. (laughs) Oh, I wish. I wish. Yeah. Oh yeah, so I remember that day you were river, you wanted, to, I call it river scuba diving, apparently it's not called that. Tell me how you got into um, river snorkeling. So I got into it uh, this year actually, because I know a couple of friends in Oregon who who do it for a hobby and do it for like underwater photography and as a career, and I thought like that's super awesome. I grew up like fish, or not fishing, did not grow up fishing, <laughs> grew up <laughs> swimming, and I was like, that would just be super awesome because I nerd out about fish. And usually I go out with people who fish because I want to see the fish themselves and not even catch anything. Um, so I was like, river snorkeling would be awesome. And you pretty much just have to buy like a super thick wetsuit because a lot of these streams are freezing mm-hmm. and a snorkel and a mask and maybe some wading boots or even fins, depending on where you are. And you pretty much just stick your face in there and just swim and look at these fish. And so it's the exact same thing as you would do in Hawaii, but colder, more dangerous, and you're just looking at trout, but it's super awesome. Mm -hmm. Um, Got into it this year in Oregon, but as you're going through it, you have to see like the little stoneflies, the little caddisflies, like actually in the water and how the fish are feeding and where they're hiding out at and what their behavior is. And so everything that an angler would be doing on the water of saying like, oh, a rainbow trout attacks a little harder than a cutthroat trout or they're a little shyer like you're seeing all of that in their natural habitat without actually having to disturb them wow that's really cool you kind of got me thinking about it I'm like terrified of water mm-hmm. that's a long story <laughs> <laughs> why a whitewater boat and fish don't ask me I don't know I know <laughs> But I remember that pool and there's like a big pool that I fish in right now Mm -hmm. all winter and you kind of got me thinking of like, I really want to know, like, what are they eating? How big are they? Because I heard there's some like monsters in this one pool. I don't even know if it's illegal. Like, can you dive anywhere or is there like restrictions about that? You can pretty much. You can pretty much dive anywhere unless it's on like private property and Mm -hmm. then that's when you're trespassing. Mm -hmm. Um, That's another topic we can touch upon about like colonization of land right <laughs> but you can pretty much go snorkeling anywhere as long as you like decontaminate your items before so you don't bring around like invasive species or invasive like mussels and stuff mm-hmm. but you can pretty much just stick your head in any body of water yeah. um I went snorkeling in a lake up in Colorado and I you would see rainbow trout swimming around and I saw about five but once I put on a wetsuit and kind of floated into the deeper area I'm like holy crap there's about 30 or 40 fish in this one section that's Mm -hmm. stocked and they're actually not feeding on the surface they're feeding subsurface Mm -hmm. and I was like maybe I'll bring my fly rod out and see if like that theory is true and like kind of having a nymph float underneath the surface rather than having a dry fly Mm -hmm. and it worked because I'm like there's a bunch of fish here even though you saw five on the surface or you see like a couple um biting every now and then or bubbling once you go deeper into the surface, you'll see a lot more that you're not seeing on top of the surface. Okay. I'm thinking we need, you need to come back out. Yes. <laughs> I'm not, here. I'm not snorkeling in the snow and considering it's six degrees over there, that's impossible. <laughs> Did I say six? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We'll do it in the summer and maybe we'll find a pool where all you have to do is put on a mask and snorkel and just stick your head down and not have to be in the water. <laughs> so funny. <laughs> I'm going to need a bigger fish bag. Like, 
here <laughs> and my snorkel stuff and then I can just picture like two people showing up and then sticking their head in and that's yeah okay I'm done I'm that's done. pretty much it yeah the looks that you would get is hilarious but it's so <laughs> worth it <laughs> it's a little awkward which it's okay. okay. <laughs> I totally forgot to ask you, and I wanted to ask you this earlier. I got carried away and you nerding out. You just caught your first carp. Tell me about that, like everything. I want to hear everything about your first carp. <laughs> it was such an adventure. It took a total of 10 hours. It was from 10. six, it was 6 a.m. It was a 6 a.m. We had to be on the water. So it was a five, five o'clock wake up call six o'clock on the water until 11 a.m. So it was a five hour day for two days because the first day I came out there, I brought my brother and I met an awesome individual. His name is Lino Jubilato and I met him through Instagram, but he is like the carp master and also being born and raised in Southern California, you don't have a lot of waters here that you would want to fish in. Mm -hmm. um, so he oftentimes fishes in a section of the LA river that runs into LA into Long Beach. And if you're not familiar with the area, you can just think of like industrialized city, urban um, river. And the entire river is concrete. So there are no natural habitats. There are no rocks or boulders or, or trees. It's all highways and concrete. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you're getting out there, the first thing you'll smell is like sulfur and methane from who knows is what's in the water. And it's wafting up into your face. And this is at 6 a.m. So there's no sunlight out. And um, this is the first day. And so my brother and I are like, where are we right now? Like, we understand it's the LA River, but I wasn't expecting like homeless camps and like shopping carts in the water mm -hmm. and refrigerators and like a bunch of plastic bags. And yeah, I kept making jokes about dead body. And we're just like, let's not talk about that right now. <laughs> and so carp fishing is a lot harder than I expected it to be. Whereas like with trout, you can actually either catch um, cast a nymph or a dry fly out and the the fish would just kind of jump at the surface right um carp they actually have mouths that move down a little bit more whereas the trout would have the mouth that goes like this so they're able to maneuver it anywhere yeah carp like, are like kind of like a vacuum yes yeah kind yeah. of like a, the Roomba of <laughs> the, the rivers <laughs> and just to clarify carp are like invasive non-native species that are introduced from Asia and so there are a lot of them and they impede into every waterway possible and it's really impossible to get rid of them they're just pretty much giant goldfish mm -hmm. and so these trout are um, pretty much just eating muck at the bottom and they're not looking at anything else but at the bottom just it's just cleaning and vacuuming along the river and so in this case with the fly you actually have to send it a lot deeper then you think and then use an indicator or what I call a bobble and <laughs> and kind of just like watch for any sort of indication and so what I learned a lot from Lena was like a lot of patience mm -hmm. and a lot of still water so the water was very still a lot of stagnant not a lot of current going into it but just watching this tiny indicator make any sort of movement because the carp how they feed is that anything that's in their way, they'll just suction it in and spit it out right away if it's not edible. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a very quick like movement, very minute. And so if you're missing that, you're not going to catch the carp. Mm -hmm. So unlike trout where the whole entire indicator would just jolt, the carp would just be like a little bounce. Was that wind? Was that water? Was that a carp? You know, a little bobble. A little bobble. And so either way, you just have to like set the hook no matter what. And so it was five hours out there um, met a couple of individuals as well, and everyone got to hook a fish, but not everyone got to catch one. The first day, I, I hooked about three, and you're lucky I didn't catch any fish with you that day, because I have the most anxiety when I have to reel in a fish. Like, I, one of the reasons why I hate fishing is that having that fish on the hook and, like, not knowing to do, like, do I reel in? Do I strip it in? Do I, like, how do I set and there's just a lot to do and I don't want to hurt the fish. Like that's the last thing I want to do. Yeah. So there's a lot of steps to bring in the fish after you set the, the set the hook. And so the entire time I'm screaming and Lino's like, it's fine. <laughs> just keep reeling it in. And I lost about three that day. Um, but my brother was able to catch one. So I was like, okay, that's whatever, mm -hmm. you know, like whatever. I'm the fish biologist. Doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> and I went out with him. 
this past Sunday, again, 6 a.m., did the whole thing. But in this case, within the whole five hours, not a single bite and not a single hook. And it wasn't until the last 15 minutes, I was like, Lino, I'm giving it another 15 minutes and then we should leave and come back another day, you know? And we were just like, oh, like felt so defeated. And we cast it out into a current. As the current's taking the bobble out further, he's like, set, set, set. I'm like, I don't know what he's seeing. This entire time he's telling me to set. I was like, I don't know if it's fighting or what he's seeing, but he's just a master. And so I set and I'm walking backwards and it's this heavy, heavy fish. And it feels like you got caught on a boulder. And so I spent... 10 minutes at least fighting this fish and it felt like a salmon um I oppose I suppose it felt like a salmon I've never caught a salmon but I'm reeling this fish in for 10 minutes I'm screaming I'm like blacking out for the most of it because I'm like I need to catch this fish because I'm not coming back to the LA river anytime soon <laughs> and I'm like Lino get your butt into the water like go out further I don't care if you trip but I need you to net that fish because I'm not coming back here he's like I'm not coming back here either and so <laughs> We're both like, okay, come on, fish. And the fish is like turning over, doing that death roll. And I don't see it anything inside. I'm like, I feel like I caught a shark. My entire forearm is like radiating heat and it's like quivering at this point. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> you know? And the whole like rod is like, I'm doing a two hand rod at this point, just kind of like keeping the, the line tight. And last minute he was able to scoop it up. And we were just like, whoa. <laughs> and as you saw on my Instagram page, it was just like, the biggest carp possible and I was like this is just awesome um yeah <laughs> that is amazing well congratulations <laughs> thank you that was the biggest fish I've ever caught on a fly <laughs> that is so well, yeah what kind of fly do you even use <laughs> he calls it a green egg and ham and he actually created it himself which is oh, super sweet. awesome yeah. yeah that's really bad amazing yeah I just saw his um vice video um, mm -hmm. so I was like I was so jealous that you got to go fish with Nino <laughs> oh he is such a character it's amazing to see like all of these places are oftentimes oftentimes overlooked like even I was biased of like that river is nasty I would never go into it but then him being inside of that river and and teaching me about the environment and the habitat and knowing about the fish I was like holy crap like I'm starting to have more of an appreciation for these nasty urban streams that are you know under the rug that's one of the things that in the industry for example yeah. of um particularly like fishing industry marketing people they're saying like there's no people of color and I'm like you probably drive over them on the LA river they're probably at the pier you know they are in the mm -hmm. places that aren't these like beautiful majestic yeah um, Colorado streams you know mountain streams like I am very I I totally recognize my privilege because I get to mm -hmm. live in the Gunnison Valley watershed which is just so healthy and amazing and beautiful okay I'll stop bragging <laughs> but <laughs> we get it Erica <laughs> <laughs> but like there's so much representation if you're just looking if you actually look yeah. from these different areas that we like to call like fishing you know and so I just love that story and you know that appreciation that you have found because that is literally like how to build community and to have representation is meeting people where they're at sharing that stoke you know building that family so I'm just so stoked and then that you caught those big fish and I know the feeling of like the arm getting tired and you're just like anxiety is high and black yeah and it was, it was so fun <laughs> I was like screw the gym let's just practice carp fishing all year long yeah. it's just a bunch of casts and like really I was like holy crap it was like the most action I got all year, so I'm not complaining, but. <laughs> Speaking of action, let's talk about your dating life. Oh, um, it's non-existent. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> oh, well, that was anti <laughs> That's easy. That's okay. <laughs> Next. <laughs> Save us some time. <laughs> so there's a couple comments that came in. Um, oh, gosh. One, one's a question, one's a comment. One comment was, why don't these girls come up on my Tinder? Okay. <laughs> Hey. The other is, what's the dating scene been like as a seasonal biologist? My friends and I are all in the same boat of not being able to really commit to anything because we move around so much. I'm going to start crying because I felt their pain. It has been a year full of like self-reflection on like the values in life. And even 
like the hardest part of like being a seasonal biologist is being a seasonal biologist during a pandemic Mm -hmm. because it just makes people meeting people a lot harder and that I completely agree with that person is that it's really hard to commit to anyone or anything um regardless of like romantic relationship or even like friendship relationships it's Mm -hmm. it's hard like meeting you and then knowing that there is going to be a time and place where I have to pick up and move again but even though we're friends it's like you know it's not going to be like a, a weekend trip to meet up anymore and that goes the same goes for relationships and oftentimes where I'm on these dating platforms on social media like Hinge or Tinder or Bumble and it's like oftentimes I have to be honest with myself and with them and saying like hey I'm only here for six months for the time being that I know of I'm gonna be straightforward with you I don't know what you're looking for I'm not looking for a hookup but I'm also you know wanting to put myself out there and like nine, nine out of 10 times, people will be like, okay, let's just stop talking all together. Even though it's like a huge window before I have to even leave. Yeah. Or people who are like romantically inclined with me. Mm-hmm. And then even if I move an hour away, they're like, I can't do this. It's too long distance. Um, so dating is especially hard. Um, I'm not complaining because it's a good trade-off for how I live my life of being able to explore and just work in the streams and I wouldn't give it up and I'm super passionate about it but that's a huge sacrifice. Mm. I feel like a lot of seasonal people are making right now of not being able to hold down a relationship or even form cohesive you know actual relationship with people. Mm. Yeah that sounds hard but I also said, like, that to me sounds ideal. <laughs> <laughs> like, do, are there any, like, uh, single fish biologists you work with? Because <laughs> I don't want anyone living up in here in my space, so. <laughs> Surprisingly um, not, <laughs> for some reason. <laughs> oh, man. Who do you work with? Like, how are they dating? Are they married? Like, do they have families? Like, what's that look like? So I don't really have coworkers right now. They're my age. And a lot of people that I work with are permanent people, permanent mm-hmm. biologists or scientists and whatnot. But a lot of my friends who do move around mm-hmm. um, are either in committed relationships that whose partner move around with them to different places and kind of like compromise in a way. And other people who are just like long distance makes it work somehow. And then other people who are just like, it's impossible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, dang. So, can you? I, I personally cannot date anybody that fishes. <laughs> I have come to find <laughs> the, the last couple of years. <laughs> like, it's like once you start like sleeping with somebody and like combine your favorite hobby, like it's just not a good mix. Like, I, I notice these like arguments and like critiques. You know, it's like not only did you like burn dinner last night but you also like didn't set the hook you know and it's like yeah and sometimes anyway so I've now don't date any fly fishing people whatsoever so what about you (laughs) um that's like my immediate left swipe every single time I see a picture with a guy holding up a fish just (laughs) so I think I'd be open to dating a fly fisher if they were (laughs) <laughs> doing it more for the love of fishing and not for the sport of it mm. mm-hmm. if that makes sense because I fish because I want to see the fish itself I don't really fish to set personal records mm. or post pictures and stuff mm. um but a lot of people that I've met so far who go out and fish do it to you know glow or or have something to talk about and hold up these beautiful trophy fish and that's not what I'm about I'm like good for you but I don't think I would like to have that as a relationship (laughs) yeah like they get really technical about it or really (laughs) like down you know and yes other people if they're not catching like uh, yeah I definitely or or like super pretentious like I remember going on a date with one guy and he was just like oh indicators I'm like they're glorified baubles just call it what it is it's fine (laughs) Oh, I'm definitely not too attached to terms, so. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I think I might actually adopt Bobble. <laughs> I'm, 
I'm gonna start saying bobble because it makes people angry. And I'm like, how? Just get off your high high horse. It's a bobble. It's a thing that floats in the water yeah. because you can't tell that the fish is biting on it. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I think it's funny that you have you swipe left on anybody with a fish. Um, uh, yeah. the, the way that I got into fishing was not only through YouTube, but I my strategy. <laughs> was to swipe right on every single guy holding a fish oh wow yeah and so um this was also in Wyoming so there wasn't Mm -hmm. many people and pretty much every man was holding a fish (laughs) same with Colorado (laughs) too right yeah it's it's either fish or elk (laughs) (laughs) they're holding up the horns like all serious yep it's either fish elk or a hiking photo on like a 14er that they make when they're holding it's like yeah (laughs) <laughs> I don't want that face on top of me. No, no, no. <laughs> I ended up meeting some really awesome fly fishing guys on Tinder. And that's what kind of helped me like perfect my casting and kind of learn mostly everything about fishing. And it's actually how I got onto the water um, was, you know, through like most guys on boats. And so, mm-hmm. I've always learned, like, my whole first, like, two years of fishing was from a boat, like, a drift boat. Yeah. I have been really struggling with trying to like waiting, <laughs> so I've been trying to um, utilize my Tinder resources here in Colorado um, for the people of boats, so. <laughs> oh, my God. I think you're doing super well, though. Like, how long ago did you start fishing or fly fishing? Uh, about three years ago, three and a half about- years ago. And, like, now looking at your awkward angler Instagram post, you're catching all these, like, beautiful brown trouts and kokanee, and I feel like that is the smartest way to go about using an online dating platform. So kudos to you. Yeah. I mean, I was very, like, upfront about what I was doing, and they just, like, one, stoked that, like, they matched with somebody in Wyoming, which is the least Mm -hmm. populated state. Uh, <laughs> and they're like, oh, and this girl likes to fish too. Like, cool. So I'm actually still really connected to most of the folks that I met in Wyoming and mm-hmm. the awesome guides that um, answered all of my questions. And that's kind of how I, yeah, it was just like, I'm so curious about this guide life, fly fishing guide life. I've done, been an outdoor guide and other things, but not fishing. So anyway, I've learned a ton from from folks on Inst- on uh, Tinder. <laughs> Oh my gosh. I mean, I have a question. Right on fish. (laughs) (laughs) Complete opposites, but one works for. (laughs) I I have a question for you. So like getting back into like the fly fishing and since I'm trying to get better at it, I'm slowly reaching out to more folks on Instagram, just learning more about their background and like their, their care, like charisma and their um, personality. And like some people I'm not afraid of reaching out to. So I reached out to you. Mm -hmm. I reached out to Lino. I went carp fishing with, it's like, Oftentimes, I'm afraid of reaching out to like the stereotypical guys that usually go fly fishing. Like, how do you, what would you suggest on how I can be better at fly fishing and what resources I can look into rather than Tinder? Ah, dang it. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Rather than Tinder. (laughs) I have come to find um, most people on Instagram are really approachable and it's Mm -hmm. Really, it's just that initial awkwardness because we're not used to communicating, just sending a random message, you know, because traditionally, um, you know, it's meeting a person or through a friend and, you know, all this like stigma about online dating, you know, mm-hmm. and sliding into someone's DMs, you know, you don't want to look creepy. But I honestly think that that is like the evolution of communication, which is really beautiful. And I've been able to reach out to tons of, uh, you know, other men, like cisgendered, older, or my age guys that were super accepting of like, hey, I mean, I'm just curious, you know, Mm -hmm. this is where I'm at, and I have this question, you know, and typically they, um, like, have, like, like, how do I get better at this, you know, I, I, like, the other day, somebody posted about beads, you know, like, fishing with beads, and I know people have their own opinion about it, like, I'll use whatever works, I don't really care, so (laughs) I was, like, hey, like, I forgot, I've learned how to tie one on last year, but I forgot, Uh like, would you mind just showing me, and they're, like, sure, 
And so they like even sent me like a link and resources and stuff. So just stuff like that. Like I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't think too hard about it. I think that's mm-hmm. kind of like our human nature is to overthink things <laughs> when really in the fishing oh, trail, we're pretty open for the most part I'm coming to find. Mm-hmm. Um, people definitely don't come off as approachable sometimes, but I think if you're following somebody for a while, you know, and you kind of have some conversation and whatnot, it's, it's a little bit easier to to get into. I would say like any of the, I have a really awesome um, network within the Brown Folks Fishing Ambassador crew. Mm -hmm. We have this, um, this like chat that goes on and it's just so awesome connecting and um, we'll either like post fish photos, of course, or we'll ask questions and, you know, there's always somebody willing to, to jump in. And so I would encourage you to maybe look at some Brown Folks Fishing Ambassadors as well. Um, super knowledgeable and they don't just always like there's all different types there's like spin casting there's saltwater there's um, bass spin fishing I don't know there's just you know every type um, of ambassador will will do something else and they're super open to answering questions like that's why we're an ambassadors because like we are open to being the representation and being helpful so Mm -hmm. like reach out to me if you want like if you have a specific question about something like I'm happy to like point you in in a great resource or a great person that might know. So that's, that's just kind of how I've built my, my own community <laughs> is through, through Brown Folks Fishing, which has been pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah, they are pretty awesome. So thank you for kind of reminding me about that resource. Um, yeah. And yeah. another question I've been super curious and like genuinely wanting to ask you for a while now is that when I go out fishing or hiking, it's really hard for me to disassociate myself from my career because I'm a fish biologist and it's like that is you know I'm on the water therefore this is just like my career and this is what my job looks like but also my hobby is it what how how do you go about your DI efforts do you talk about work on the water do you have these hard conversations or do you kind of have a place in time for all of that yeah I definitely have office hours (laughs) (laughs) Um, yeah I think separating like because I I have come to find especially this week fishing has been my like escape and so yeah. it's been really tough um mentally so I've been able to like leave my um DI work at home and then once I leave the door it's just like I don't even need to fish it's just sitting by the river you know mm-hmm. it's just like being outside and kind of like reminding myself of like why I like to do this and understanding like again where how privileged I am (laughs) to live in this area and I kind of focus on those things and there are certain times where shit will happen on the water like somebody will say something that's pretty messed up but I think I have a skill (laughs) I have come to find which is like appropriately telling people like, that's not appropriate. I'll kind of be like, oh, my bad. I do have friends that I've fished with before that expect me to work on the water. Like, okay. they see something and they want me to do something about it. And, mm-hmm. you know, that's also drawing a boundary of, like, I need to protect my own, like, emotional and mental well-being. And there, it takes a lot of energy to do anti-racist work. And so it's just kind of drawing a boundary there's like also a spectrum of right and wrong you know so like when's appropriate for me to say something or not so that's kind of what I don't know if that helps you with your work no No, I was just genuinely curious because um because a lot of folks now are like like with me it's like I don't mind having that conversation because the outdoors is a very vulnerable environment for people to actually open up and have these hard conversations but I'm also not doing it as a career like you are Mm -hmm. and um, there are time in a place where I'm like, I just need to be out here to be out here and take care of my mental health and not talk about social injustice. And, yeah. you know, there are other people paid to do this work and therefore you should go seek professional resources and pay them adequately to, you know, kind of help you out and do the learning process with you instead of asking every BIPOC individual or folks in the LGBTQ plus community to educate a person. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I've been pretty clear about boundaries. Like, I'm happy to have this conversation with you. Mm -hmm. 
Like I can either invoice you after this conversation <laughs> or <laughs> if you want to set up a time, like here's my hourly rate. So yeah. I have no problem um, doing that as well. Cause that's also establishing like, Hey, I'm happy to have this conversation, but mm -hmm. know that this is like my line of professional work. And so it, yeah. So drawing that line has been really helpful. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. So I think those are all my questions that I've had from other folks. Yeah. Anything else on your mind that you, we didn't touch on that you would like to? Um, no, I'm kind of curious to hear input from other folks within the fishing community, whether or not they date other fish people. I like wonder if that's like a trend or like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know how rock climbers only date like rock climbers so they can <laughs> rock climb together. Like I wonder if fish people only date fish people to either have access to a drift boat or <laughs> get free guiding or something, you know? <laughs> so maybe you can like work your magic with your brown folks fishing community or awkward angler community and put that as a poll out there and be like, do you date other fish people or is that like a turn off for you, you know? <laughs> it's a really good question. I'm actually curious <laughs> myself. Um, I've noticed a lot of couples do fish together. And so yeah. like, hmm, like, I couldn't stand it. <laughs> <laughs> but then I also can't stand the thought of like dating someone who hates being outdoors or be like fishing for fun, you know, or like trying it out. So I think there's a fine balance of like, I don't want a person who is like overly confident in fly fishing and would like mm. mansplain to me in a relationship. Mm. But I also want a person who is like open to try it out. I yeah. know, I think you're just like, no, oh, this is my space, back off. But... <laughs> Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I did meet a guy that was very like he wasn't super outdoorsy and I loved it because uh, he, did his <laughs> thing. Um, he was an engineer and like did his thing all day and I went out I used to like backpack a lot so I would go on these extended trips and he was just so welcoming when I got home like he had a glass of wine for me when I walked in the oh door and like had dinner ready and was just so excited to hear about my adventures um, you know, and then I got to hear about his work. So it was really good for like conversation and just like that connecting at the end of the day. Um, and I loved it, you know, but he was also open to like trying things, which was nice. Um, I took him on his first camping trip <laughs> in Yellowstone and he had a blast. He's like, oh, it was fun, but like, glad I did it. And I was like, perfect. <laughs> Oh, I've dated all of the people I've dated so far have been like anti outdoors, like <laughs> loves golfing as a hobby, um, hates hiking. And so, but it, it also came with like a sensitive ego almost of like, oh, she's too independent. It got to a point where one person who I was dating, they're just like, why are you always hiking by yourself? Like, isn't that dangerous? Like, don't you need a person? And kind of feeling like, mm -hmm self-conscious about it and I was like I don't know if this is yeah. a good balance in a relationship yeah I hear that yeah yeah Not good. but yeah put that poll up I'm interested to okay. see okay. what people have to say I definitely will yeah once we launch this I'll actually add in the poll as well because that's super funny and I'm curious <laughs> <laughs> So I guess just kind of like last question, um, like what are you working on next or like what's, what's next for you in your, either your work or personal life or all of it? <laughs> yeah. So professional life, I guess I am working on a macro invertebrate or like freshwater bug ID that will be available and free to everyone in the entire state of Colorado and beyond. And so I'm super excited. I'm working with, um, other individuals and like entomologists who are like professionals in identification, but also working with educators to make it like kid friendly and family friendly. So that my whole goal is to have people use it as a resource in their fly fishing kit and better understand like what goes with like that match the hatch pretty much, but kind of tie it back to the conservation that make it understandable. Yeah. Um, my job ends mid January. So if anyone wants to hire me, I'm up for grabs. <laughs> and yeah, side projects are coming up. I have my website published soon. So that'll be accessible as well come December, January mm -hmm. and a side project as well that I'm happy to share once it's up and running that Erica knows about and she's helping me out with, but that'll be in the 
the works for now. Yay. Yeah, you got a lot going on and uh, upcoming things are exciting. So anything else that you want to share? Um, if anyone wants to show me how to be better at fly fishing or fly tying, please reach out to me because I'm wanting to learn and just be on the water. Like Erica, she was super awesome to be a tour guide for the day. So I super appreciate anyone who is willing to take me on. <laughs> awesome. Well, you do make a mean Michelada. So um, yeah, great fishing buddy as well. So <laughs> And I really appreciate this time and having this conversation with you, Erica. So thank you for the invite. I'm so glad that you did. Oh, I learned so much. I was like trying to take notes and stuff and like, yeah, yeah. Such good conversation. So thank you. Yeah. All right. We'll say goodbye. Bye. Bye. Five minutes after our conversation, Anna had texted me a link in regards to her usage of hermaphrodite. She sent me a link about gender bending fish, and we'll start to use that term. Be sure to follow Anna on Instagram at Anna underscore venturing. Thank you for listening to today's episode. Head over to awkwardangler.com for show notes and resources. You can send appreciations by subscribing, sharing with a friend, rating the podcast, or Venmo at Awkward Angler. Special thanks to my brown folks fishing family for your support. I'm Erica Nelson, inviting you to be an awkward angler. See you next week.